Uh, thank you. I, I think coffee starts at 10 o'clock, so I'm not sure what the protocol is. Um, <laughs> watch the anxious face. Actually, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, if we're boring, get up, go get coffee. How's that? So this is seriously, like, I'm just a, oh my god, I never, I, I have so much trouble sitting in an audience like this all the time. Uh, it's not on? You guys can hear me anyway, can't you? Yeah. So, Miriam had asked me to interview, I think Randy would rather be a conversational, and, and given that I have a podcast, I've interviewed over hundreds of business leaders, I thought I would just have fun and, uh, and try to make this conversational. Hopefully there's value to everyone in the room. Um, Actually, can we find out who's in the room? Is that okay? I know it's your show, but... No, no, it's okay. your show. So, how many uh, entrepreneurs are in the room? Okay, that's good. That's good Investors usually like grunt or give the secret investor code because you never want to put your hand up because all the entrepreneurs are looking. So anybody who wants to actually admit they're an uh, investor in the room? Okay, good, good. Couple, good, good, good. Uh, yeah, he's the guy filming us, yeah. And then how, how many of you are like what we call ecosystem partners? You're here supporting the whole ecosystem. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, good. See, that helps. I like that. I know. Well, now I know what not to talk about. How's that? Exactly, exactly. So I'm actually, just to get started, maybe, maybe if you want to, I don't know how long or quick you could do this, quick introduction on who you are and what you're doing and why you're here talking on stage. Okay. So um, <laughs> I'm here, I think, because uh, Yuri and... Uh, Nako made the mistake of giving me a Canadian Angel of the Year last year. So, uh, but um, uh, to be honest, I, I started uh, in politics, HIS, um, and I was, uh, I was in economic development. I was in technology economic development. And uh, my thought process when I left politics was that all of you geeks, uh, you need more, uh, more guys like me, marketing who don't mind microphones and a little less tact to build businesses. And so I started as an entrepreneur and I had three startups. My first one was my most successful. I had um, the first internet service provider in the province I live in. Um, I then had uh, the rights for, uh, uh, you'll now know how old I am. So uh, any, anybody below the age of 32 has no clue who this name is, Peter Gabriel. Uh, I had, yeah, so all the old people are going, ooh, Peter Gabriel, all the other the millennials are going, what the fuck? Anyway, so uh, there I dropped the F, first F-bomb for the conference. Um, so uh, yeah, so, but that was, a, that was a train wreck. So we kind of have a rule when we're helping entrepreneurs that uh, you have to have built one, sold one, and blown one up. And if you haven't, you're just a consultant. So um, I, I have done all of that ecosystem. And then my passion was, and I think all of you from LADAM would understand this, uh, the province I lived in was frustrating. Everybody was making so much money off real estate and oil and gas that it felt like we couldn't get their attention to go into tech investing. And so I took it upon myself because my economic development background and my, my exits to start the first angel group in, in my province. Uh, and it's become super large. I've been doing it now for 15 years. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I hate finance. I really do. Um, and any of you who are entrepreneurs, financing your business is actually the worst and it sucks so much, right? So I actually have hated my job for 15 years, if that makes sense. I, I love meeting all of you, but just the whole uh, relationship to money is so hard, right? And um, so, yeah, so we've been very successful. We're, the, we're always in the top five angel groups. Uh, we've funded over 230 startups. We've put $60 million into startups. And the other reason I'm here today is that the, re the way we've done our financing has created its own ecosystem. Like we, we teach entrepreneurs how to raise money before they go to our angel group. You go to our angel group, we have six funds, and then we actually have our own M&A group. So we literally, we call it cradle to exit. And I've been uh, taking that ecosystem approach to investing around the world. We have, a, we have a LATAM fund. We've done six investments in the region. Uh, the investment I'm most proud of is the one we've done in South Sudan, uh, where I think we're the only angel investors in South Sudan. Um, and, and that entrepreneur has been paying us uh, the dividends every month. So it's very impressive. So, so that's a bit of my background. International, uh, passionate about entrepreneurship, passionate about building ecosystems, and pretty good at financing. How's that? I like it. I like it. Great work. Um, I'm excited to learn anyways. I, I, I put a number of questions here. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be good. But since we're at the LATAM conference, I thought we'd just start off by getting your thoughts 
on why you think it's important for startups, the startups, specifically the startups in the room, to think globally from the start? Yeah. So I think one of the th problems we have as Canadians is very similar. To, I think why Canadians and, and Latin America get along so well is that we're actually not. So wait, before I offend them, how many, uh, how many of my cousins, AKA south of the 49th are here? Oh, thank God, there's only two of you. Okay, <laughs> I think the reason we get along is we're not Americans. And, and so we live in a country where we have 35 million people spread across six time zones. And if you're an entrepreneur and you don't get, you do, that's not enough of a customer base, then you're already screwed, right? I can go to San Francisco for t from two hours from where I live, Vancouver, I live in Calgary now, and I can meet eight and a half million people in the Bay Area, and I can rent a car, and I can drive an extra two hours to go to Los Angeles to get another 22 million. And in those two cities in two days, I can get the entire population base or customer base that I can have from my whole country. All the good entrepreneurs I've ever met from Canada, I meet in an Air Canada or WestJet lounge. I wasn't sure who your sponsor was, so I thought I'd spray it. Um, <laughs> Like, and, and that should be LATAM too. Like right now, LATAM has such a massive population, but the buying power of the population is what's, uh, what's getting you down. If you're gonna build a company, you have to be thinking where we live. You have to go to the places where people have money to spend. And, uh, and if you don't, um, it's okay to build a local startup, but don't be expecting US type venture and angel money for that, that localized startup. So I'm really passionate about being a global citizen, and we have a better chance of doing it than our cousins do. Uh, the reason there's not a lot of our cousins here is only 45% of them have passports. So that's the other thing is, they actually don't give a shit to come visit you. And so, um, you know, you have to spend the time getting passionate about revenues and sales and, and where, your, where your customers are. Oh, that's great. Um, so, I mean, you're coming from the Canadian entrepreneur, Canadian ecosystems and running, running angel groups. I'm wondering, like, why did you, or maybe within your groups, are looking to invest into international startups, making partnerships uh, with investors in all these emerging markets now? Well, so the same problem you have as an entrepreneur, you have as an investor. There's only so much deal flow. Actually, that's not true. Uh, how, again, how many entrepreneurs in the room are, are there? Put your hand up, again, this is fun. Interactive, it's before coffee, right? Keep your hand up, okay? All of you, come on, higher, higher. How many of you entrepreneurs are raising money still? Keep your hand up. Okay, out of all of you raising money, how many of you think you have the most amazing deal I'm ever going to see? Right? So, so the problem is I have so much deal flow. Just ask me how much of it is really crappy deal flow. So, so we have the same problem. Like as investors, we're trying to do good deals all the time. And uh, there's not enough you know, population base to support that all the time. And the other thing is, as investors, we're fighting the same fight you're fighting. So this is to help you kind of with an investor perspective. Um, I've actually got run out of some really good deals. I was the first investor, and in Canadians would know this, a company called Skip the Dishes. And I actually got run out of that deal because the Skip the Dishes entrepreneurs thought the guys from Wattpad and Shopify were cooler than I was, and they took their money instead of mine. So I'm, not, I'm getting crappy deal flow, and I'm getting run out of the good deal flow. So everybody as an investor is trying to find proprietary deal flow that other people aren't seeing. We try to cultivate being the coolest investor. We have to do brand management of ourselves. I want you to bring me the deal because you think, wow, I can add value. I've got brand, I've got cachet. So we're fighting as investors to meet the best deals. And we had to go global to get some of that. So we're really proud about our LATAM fund. We've got a fund in Southeast Asia. And we literally moved from just running an angel group to having uh, venture debt funds, equity funds, et cetera. So our investors also got more wins. So it's a, we're fighting the game of trying to become professional investors for a long period of time. If we make five bad investments in a row, that's called philanthropy and we stop being angel investors, right? <laughs> so. so, I mean, are, are you saying you're cooler outside of Canada? No, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, okay, come on. How many Canadians have gone to Europe with the logo on their backpack? I always get a kick out of it. All of you are on the Air Canada flight to London and you all have your Canada sweatshirts on. It's so cute, right? So, no, we do. Like, there is some brand about being Canadian and global. 
and in fact, in front of my, in my angel group in Western Canada, the number of Latinos that are part of my angel group or, or Anglos that married Latinos from Argentina, th there was a, there's a natural connection to South America. It's not like we just got on a plane and went to Santiago and said, oh, Corfo's asked us to come so they can give us money. It's literally, no, it went because somebody knew somebody who had a good deal, and we have the same fight you do, is how do we get to customers so we can have we can have the fight together? So we've got just I don't think our deals are any cooler in Canada. I just think we fought the fight that you and Latin America are fighting now. We fought it for longer, so we've got some experience in how to deal with our cousins. Yeah. So Randy, you've been to Latin America. Yeah, a lot, lots of a times. Lot. So <laughs> I want to know what your thoughts or your the experience that you're having with investors and the startups in the region now. So I think the coolest part about being Canadian is we start with a, a sense of we're all in the soup together. And so there's almost a more built-in trust with entrepreneurs and investors because a lot of us that are investing in startups and venture capital started as entrepreneurs. In LADAM, your investor base is really different. Um, you guys actually think a degree from Harvard is actually important. So I see a lot of investment bankers who have lots of training. I see lots of people from family offices. So the investor pool isn't made up of entrepreneurs who had an exit and are doing investing. It's corporate finance geeks with a, with a degree who are working for a family office. And you as entrepreneurs don't trust them. And you shouldn't. Um, and they don't trust you and they shouldn't. So the biggest issue I found in LADAM is how can we as Canadians in the middle bridge the trust factor? The family offices don't want to give you money because you actually don't return it. <laughs> and you don't want to take money from the family offices because they don't know how to be involved in a company where they actually don't take control of it. So the interesting part for me in LADAM has been that bridge between corporate finance approach to startup investing um, and, and that bridge of trust, I think, is the biggest thing you have to overcome. I'd love some comments back on that. That's just one guy's observation from being in a lot of countries, that the, you, the, the conversation doesn't happen in LADAM. Um, whether we like it or not, if I can keep going, I'm going to anyway, you know that, so your job is also to do this. Um, this whole thing, this entrepreneur investor thing is like a big game of Tinder, right? It literally is, got it, got it, need it, got it, or swipe left, swipe right. You gotta come and be impressive in 30 seconds, that really sucks. Um, you got two minutes, um, don't do a product demo at a conference while I'm drinking scotch, you know, like the, all these little dating rules, right? And then on the other side of the dating rules too is the whole, remember in high school, like all the guys will remember going to a high school dance and being up against the wall trying to be a cool guy, but you're just not. You're just a high school geek, and you can't get a date because the cool girls are hanging out with the cool guys. And it feels like startup investing, doesn't it? Like how do you become the startup, you know, hot guy or hot girl? It's horrible. And, and right now, you can't break that in, in Latin America because it's just it's so insular. There isn't even the opportunity for Tinder. You have to actually know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who gets you into a family office. And um, I see a lot of things that are happening now, a lot more conferences, but you're still not getting investors out to those conferences. You're getting a lot of ecosystem partners. The bankers are all hanging out at your conferences, hanging out um, cards that say they do investing. And we all know they're full of shit. Like bankers don't invest in startups, right? So there's a lot of things in the region that we have to actually get towards more Tinder in the region. We have to actually get more opportunities for people to get just quick contacts and say, I kind of like you, let's have another meeting. And I don't see a lot of that in LATAM yet. Chile, it's different. Corfo has done a really good job of getting more of those, those opportunities. But I've been Ecuador. I mean, Ecuador is so much, woohoo, great country, by the way. But it's very corporate finance. Bolivia, I was in Bolivia. It's like you got to know somebody who's got to, and Colombia is getting better as well. So. So I'm going to ask the flip side, and we're, we're here in Canada, and I know Mary Tori was already inviting everyone to, to go shopping. Um, but why do you think Canada is a good place for these Latin American startups now? Again, I, I 
I do. I spend so much time in the United States. I, I love my cousins. So I'm feeling like as I say this again, I'm now this is my second shot of my cousins. Um, how hard is it to get an American to take a Latino or a Canadian seriously? If, if they had their choice, a Silicon Valley deal is going to be done by a bunch of Silicon Valley guys and women, and, it, and a New York deal is going to be done by New York people. And you show up from Santiago or Bogota or Quito in New York, and you're trying to get um, Fred Wilson's attention. Well, we have the same problem in Canada. Like, we show up at our cousin's desk, and we're not them. Why would they do a foreign deal when they can do a deal that's local, right? But we all need a landing pad into these other marketplaces. The best way to go into the United States is fully armed and say, I have 10,000 customers that pay me. That, that kind of stuff overcomes their bias towards, I already know somebody who knows somebody. Um, so, so again, using Canada as your landing pad, or for Canadians, going to Latin America and proving out a business model, these are the kind of things we do and then go to the United States. Um, I have a slide usually, and I think, I think this is, um, I think we've all been doing it wrong, and, and so our thesis in Valhalla is that 97% of us can't be crazy. Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, they're the only ones who do, they run this model. You have to be an angel investor. You have to do a seed round. You have to do a series A. You gotta, you gotta do your series B, and then you gotta exit. Like, it's, it's the Valley model. Well, a lot of us in the room, if we're being honest, our exit's going to be like 11 million, 12 million, 8 million. And if we're really honest, we actually don't even want to exit our company. But we're forced to run this model because these three communities do that. Well, if you think you're going to take your deal from Quito to go into Silicon Valley to run their model using their game, I think that's where we've all been failing. And so I think the 97% of us should start hanging out together and screw the, uh, the, the 3%, unless, what I call it, you're the one. If, I, I, I love this, this is the Latino culture too, right? Canadians too, our Canadians are actually, we'd half put our hand up. But if you know you're the one, if you know you're the best street fighter, the best hustler, with the best deal, with the best access to revenue, and you're going to run the model, stand up, own it, go to San Francisco, and announce yourself, hi, I'm from Quito, and I'm the one. <laughs> but if, if you don't have, if you don't have that confidence that you're the hundred million dollar exit, I think you should be looking at other ways to finance. Like, everybody's small business is still um, important. So anyway, no, I, I got going. No, I love that. I love. <laughs> I'm a half up either as well. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to put into. Um, I just wanted to put this into into the room, into the question, because I've been I've been involved with the startup land up side. I talk about cultural differences. So what have you seen um, for these international startups come through? Um, maybe the ones that you've been involved with, like, are there cultural um, you know, cultural differences, integrating into, into Canada or maybe U.S. So the funny part is anytime you go anywhere in the world, and I, I've been in 30 countries now in the last 24, 28 months, and everybody says, oh, you know, like you're in Karachi, it's different here. Oh, it, you're in Medellin, it's different here. It's bullshit. It's not different here. We all have the same problems. Investors won't talk to us. You have a crappy deal, and you've never done this before. The issue for all of you is that you aren't second or third time entrepreneurs. You actually don't know what you're doing. And that's what makes it different. So the problem is, is I remember going back in Alberta, doing an internet startup in 1992. I have a Bachelor of Arts with an English literature degree. I am useless to society, <laughs> right? I had no business running an internet company. I didn't know what I was doing, and I'm trying to get investors to give this bozo money, and I don't have any finance background. How many people in the room can relate to that story? You all have no clue what you're doing or talking about, and that's the cultural piece. It has nothing to do with your country you're from. It has nothing to do with your investor base. It actually has your deal sucks, and you don't know how to pitch it. And so I think that's the 97%. We have to spend the time 
teaching entrepreneurs the relationship to money, how dilution works, how, how maybe you should use debt. Maybe you should pay high interest like a Visa card instead of doing a Series A. But we all do want to do a Series A so we can be cool and have a T-shirt, right? I think like we just have to learn better as entrepreneurs. That's the cultural difference. It's not cultural at all. Globally, we all have a problem and we just don't know what we're doing. We need to spend more time. I wish more investors took the time um, to work with you. Yeah, I mean, so this is just a lead-up question. Not a lead-up question. I, I like you, you were talking about and maybe not telling everyone to fail their first business. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, but, but be okay with a two million dollar company. Like I think that's the problem. We're we're told you're a failure if you don't do a hundred million dollar company. I always say, if you've done your first million dollars of revenue, you don't owe anybody an apology. That's awesome. So for the startups, and the men, I, I know we're running out of time now. Um, Talk too much. Being an investor, and I think. There's a lot of entrepreneurs here. When is the ideal time to, to approach any investor or maybe approach Randy, the angel investor of the year? Oh. <laughs> um, it's funny, you all know the answer to this question, but you all pretend you don't know and when you come to talk to an investor. So I have a, I have a exercise we do in our, our two-day base camp, shameless plug, shameless plug. Um, the first thing we do in the base camp is we actually turn you into an angel investor. So pretend you sold your company and you got $10 million out personally. Now take the 10 million, go have a big party in Vegas, pay off all your debts, you know, give some money to a wealth manager and then what's left over we call magic beans, right? And if you had magic beans, how many of you would say, I'm gonna take this money and I'm gonna do this myself no more bozos, no more investor pitches, no more bad partners. I'm gonna take the money and do my next business with my own money. That's, that's one way to do it. There are others of us, I had serious PTSD after, after my companies. It's, it's really, it's, I'm gonna say it, it's really fucking hard. Um, so I went to investing because it's way easier than actually starting your company. So I can get the adrenaline hit of being an entrepreneur hanging out with you without having to do the work. <laughs> but I have a whole bunch of rules about how I'd spend my money. So if you could take that and say, okay, what would be my criteria? What would we call it my investor thesis? Every one of you in the room should have your own investor thesis. Um, I only invest in X. Uh, I want revenues. Uh, I have to believe in the team. I only work with female entrepreneurs. Like, you're all going to have different rules. My point is, every single angel you'll meet is actually just a, a schmuck or an entrepreneur with money. There isn't, like, I've gone to MBA classes and I always get a kick out of it because they treat you like a monkey in the zoo, right? All those students are there and they got their little notepad and they're trying to figure out some kind of formula of how to stick an angel investor in some kind of four point grid, right? It doesn't work. You're all people. And your grandmother and the morals your grandmother gave you and your religious background and all these things comes into your investing thesis. So this is a long-winded way to say each investor is going to have a different time to approach them because they have a different passion, right? So my big thing about Tinder, not that I've done any time on the site, I'm just saying I've heard <laughs> that the best thing to do is be yourself. Tell your story, be super passionate. I think obviously, if we're being honest, I mean, rev for me, um, I'm a revenues junkie. I, I call it a, a logo slut. I, I don't know if that translates well in Spanish, but it means I love customer logos. It's like, ooh, you show me Mercedes Benz and I become like a zombie. Yes, yeah, master, right? Other people love teams. They just love, oh, you're so passionate, your street fighter ability. I just wanna hang out with you, right? But the one thing that you can't overcome, there's no formula that can help with this, is we actually just have to kind of like each other. And because um, you're going to have to put up with this. Can you imagine this for seven years? Right? Or I have to put up with you for seven years. And the one place I'll, I, I think you'll absolutely fail as an entrepreneur is if you take the approach you've been taught, which is I'll call it pompous asshole approach. So it's, it's that balance of being the I am the one, because we want that. We want you to part the Red Sea and take us to the promised land and give me 38 times my money back, right? 
But the reality is I'm in 65 deals. I've done eight exits and my biggest exit's like a six and a half X. I don't have any failures. I have like three failures. I have 52 zombies. I have 52 people that are still running their businesses after 10 years, probably have zero hope of giving me the money back and we'll figure out some way to get it out. I've got three deals that I just know after 12 years are gonna be home runs. So I keep doing it because I'm gonna, nobody feels sorry for me by the way. But I'm just, the answer to the question is be yourself. Uh, sh tell me you don't know when you don't know. Um, be really arrogant about the things you do know. So when I say to you, oh yeah, you know what, the FinTech thing, it's over, that was last year's thing. And you go, no, 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 you're missing this. Like be, be adamant about what you know, be fragile about what you don't know, and let's see if we can go dating. Awesome. I think that's, I think that's all we have for the time, but I think Randy will be around all day. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm heading to Southeast Asia, so I'm literally after the coffee break leaving. So I'll stay for the so coffee break. So you have break. about five minutes to talk to him. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and thank you for having us. <laughs>